Hey folks, welcome back to the Visual Studio 2013 launch event. Uh, I'm Dan Fernandez. I'm going to be your host for a very exciting event. We have H Habib Hadarian. Habib, why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Habib. Uh, I've been in Visual Studio for at least uh, 10, 11 years right now, and I work on .NET. So the big thing is we are talking about .NET development, and uh, for folks watching online, make sure to get your questions in. If you have questions about you know future of .NET, what's new in .NET, and uh, specific feature questions, Habib is the guy to get them answered. So uh, we're going to try and stump him in the next 30 <laughs> minutes and make him really uncomfortable. It's going to be great. So uh, first thing, .NET developer, I'm a .NET developer. What's interesting for Visual Studio 2013? Uh, well, Dan, uh, uh, i got to say it's a very exciting time to be a .NET developer right now. Uh, if I can categorize the set of experiences and features that we've uh, done in .NET 4.5.1, I would categorize them as um, developer productivity, uh, mm -hmm. application performance, and this thing that we're calling continuous innovation. Um, let me start with uh, developer productivity. Uh, we've done a whole host of features along 64-bit uh, support uh, for it and continue. Can we just pause because that's awesome <laughs> and like the number one thing. So so now I won't get the you you must be in 32-bit uh, uh, to, to you can actually edit and continue. Exactly. Love that, it. That dialogue has been banished for good <laughs> now. No more. Uh, we've also focused on experiences that we've um, now improved up on. So in .NET 4.5, we introduced async, for example, and mm -hmm. we've got a host um, uh, a, man, a bunch of feedback from customers saying, hey. You know, I love async, but debugging async code is really hard. So now, in, right. uh, with .NET 4.5.1 and Visual Studio 2013, you can uh, debug your async code a lot easier, where you can easily see, for example, what your call stack looks like and what it, which uh, methods called which other methods, as well as if you look um, in the actual tasks window, you'll see uh, exactly the state of the various tasks as well. And then uh, last but not least, um, one of the most uh, common requested features for .NET is uh, the ability to see the return value for managed methods. So that is where, uh, imagine you're stepping through your code right now and you have a, a, a method call. Right. And today you have to step into it and then basically step all the way uh, to the method to the end and then step out again. But right. now you can simply step over that and then you're... Um, uh, debugger window, you'll actually see the return value as well. Yeah, so that in basically uh, immediate window that I'd be able to see sort of the return on the method, or how, how does a user use that? I'm in Visual Studio, I'm inside my method, and I'm going to say return false. Right. What do I... What? It's in your locals window. So oh, locals, uh, yeah, Exactly. But also you can um, use the actual immediate window by... By, by, by calling the method uh, and then uh, I'd be able uh, to... Ex exactly, okay. exactly. Um, and then on the application performance side, uh, Dan, we've uh, invested in a gamut of... Uh, uh, things. So we have a new feature called ASP.NET um, App Suspension, which is uh, a great feature uh, for both essentially enterprise IT shops as well as um, website hosters. And that's the ability where if you're hosting a number of websites on a, on a machine, for example, um, and uh, when uh, there aren't any requests to a particular website, uh, mm -hmm. Will essentially, I'm going to call it the you know dry freeze the website so to speak in a ready to go <laughs> state, and okay. then as soon as the next re request comes up, the app is uh, up and running. So uh, what will happen is, as far as the end user is concerned, it's a much much better um, experience because the application uh, is that much. Faster. So you mentioned it's an end user experience, right. and just to drill into that right. one specifically. So um, you know, say I have an internal website that you know it's the expense reports website. I, I do stuff. Right. I want to be able to use it. I want to turn it on so that way, like if there's a bunch of demand, maybe expense reports are only done on like Fridays, right? right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's another website that wants to take up demand. Right. If the first person hits it, what's actually happening? So it's my site is suspended. Yes. It then wakes up. Is there like a latency going on there? Uh, or? Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a minute la latency compared to what happens today. What happens today, uh, Dan, is essentially in uh, IIS when, let's say, USB.NET uh, website um, uh, uh, times out, for example, mm -hmm. uh, there's a verb where you terminate the website. That means the next request that comes in, then it actually has to, you have to rehydrate and spin up the ASP.NET worker process again and then be able to serve the request. Because the with the ASP.NET app suspension feature, we are essentially, uh, you know, uh, keeping everything as is and keeping it ready to go. When the request comes in, we don't actually have to then re spin up the ASP.NET worker process, then be able to. 
uh, serve the request itself. So it's a okay. big difference where you're no longer the the user is no longer paying that upfront cost for just starting up the process. Yeah. Right? So okay. So with some people sort of called cold start versus well, exactly. warm start. Exactly. That, that, that's a that's a great way to actually um, think about the 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 problem. And I guess for people who don't know, do you want to just kind of quickly explain the, uh, the difference being like cold start? It kind of has to do everything warm start. And maybe you've seen this before in Visual Studio. Like I have it up and right. I do file new project, or it's the very first time I'm doing it and file new project. Those are kind of the differences. So uh, uh, just getting ready to stump you. This is okay. Be here exciting. we go. All right. So we have our first question. Saurabh Jane, hopefully I got that name correct. What's new in .NET for multi-threading and security? So you hinted at some of the stuff around async, mm -hmm. but uh, multi-threading and security specifically. Uh, so as far as uh, .NET is concerned, what we've done is we've uh, continued to invest in, in improving the overall security of, of uh, .NET. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, the Windows update releases over time, as we have seen any security issues in .NET, we've continued to address those things uh, 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 as the um, uh, issues come up or as we've actually proactively looked through our code base and discovered you know, there's a better way of doing this in terms of security concern. As far as threading is concerned, I would say our main investment is around making things more performant. Uh, okay. Uh, so as far as the developer is concerned, you're not going to see any new surface area. It's not going to be a difference. But uh, essentially, uh, we've done what I call fundamentals work, uh, which is very low-level work uh, as far as the runtime is concerned. Meaning, I don't have to change my code. It just goes faster. Yeah. Well, one of the mantras that we have in .NET 451, Dan, and this is something that I think is going to be some, a, a, what I call uh, an enduring theme. Mm -hmm. uh, in the future, in .NET 451, what we want to do is make a statement to our users, our developers, and our customers is that your app just gets better right, by right. upgrading to the latest version of, of .NET. And it, when I look at features like a speed.NET app suspension <coughs> or things like the uh, SQL connection resiliency feature, th that's exactly that type of statement where you don't have to do any work. You might have to configure something in iOS, for example, when it comes to the ASP.NET app suspension. But as far as your code is concerned, Dan, we'd like customers, and we've received a ton of feedback that just because I have a new version of .NET, right. you know, don't make me go and change a whole host of things to be able to take advantage of uh, the work that you guys have done. So um, that's, a, that's a theme that we'll, you'll see us over and over again continue doing. While we're on the topic of fundamentals, and, and there are a couple more questions that I want to get to, but uh, breaking changes. So right. obviously, like if I'm a, a you know, previous version, I want to upgrade to 451, you know, what are some of the like tenants, if you will, that you have around around breaking changes, or or is it like, hey, upgrade and, and we've ensured that this will just work? Yes. Uh, so um, one of our core promises around .NET 451 is very, very, very high compatibility. Cool. In fact, let me share with you, Dan, how we got here. So back in uh, I'd say March, April of this year, uh, I had a, a whole chunk of my team just go and talk to our customers, ask our customers to evaluate the early bits, mm -hmm. and give us feedback. This is 75 of the largest enterprise customers that you can imagine, right? Awesome. So the bits have been through the grinder many, many <laughs> times, uh, uh, so to speak, and we got uh, early feedback, we fixed those issues, and, uh, and, and the reason why we need to make a very high compatibility bar promise then is <clears throat> .NET 451, similar to .NET 4.5, is an in-place update. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, just because you went from 4.0 or 4.5 or to 4.5.1, you cannot break customers, obviously. So right, right. We do extra, extra due diligence to make that happen. So our um, essentially stance right now is, look, we are promising customers that .NET 4.5.1 will have an incredibly bar, a high bar as far as compatibility is concerned. But if, you, if customers do find issues, uh, we have a whole host of channels. Our, our uh, MSTN blog, we have our Facebook presence, we have uh, we use a voice and so forth. Please send us feedback and, That's great. and we'll make sure that we'll get back to you. Yeah, That's and certainly great. we're hearing pretty loud and clear in terms of user voice right. too, um, which I do want to get to some of these questions. Okay, great. Yeah, so this some, is just, but, <laughs> but these, these are uh, some awesome folks. So Nicholas Peterson asks, Lambda's in immediate window coming anytime soon. How is that? Okay. Um, uh, when we were doing the 64-bit and continue feature, the yeah. thing that really we found out, uh, Dan, and, 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 and this is um, uh, it's something that's both across the, the languages as well as runtime, is that over time, as languages have evolved, mm -hmm. really when you think about the debugging experience as far as .NET is concerned, we've lagged behind somewhat. I mean, 64-bit mm -hmm. and continue, and manage turn value is a great example. I, it was the last time you were in Visual Studio. It, is, it was exactly <laughs> the last time. So now that I'm back on .NET, one thing I, I can pretty much promise folks is that we are going to catch up as far as the you know, edit 
um, compiled debug cycles concerned for .NET app. So Great. when you are in Visual Studio, really one of the hallmarks of .NET then is uh, productivity uh, is the bread and butter of .NET, right? So we need to make sure that we continue investing to support our language and our uh, debugging experience in the IDE. We don't have that in .NET 4.5.1 right now, but it's something that is right now on our backlog, literally. Okay, so one, it's a, it's something that is known right. and that, yes. that you all are looking mm -hmm. at. Uh, another very similar question, and um, <clears throat> it, it's almost the same question. Romain Carter, are we ever going to be able to trace over link in the immediate window? So I, link in the immediate window, I understand. Tracing over, I don't know if that means using trace statements or, or effectively just being able to do quick link from where select uh, yeah, um, if, if the question is, for example, you want to enter a multi-line link statement, let's say, in the mid mm -hmm. window, um, it is something that we're looking at. Unfortunately, I don't exactly know what this statement trace actually means in the mid window. Right, so right. I don't want to give you the wrong answer that I actually know what that means. Because trace is. actually, I think of trace dot right line. Yeah, so. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So um, um, Okay, uh, so that's fair. Uh, next question, Thomas, what new feature are you most proud of? Oh, this is a great question. It's oh, like okay. you have a bunch of children, now yeah. you have to pick your favorite. This is a, it is exactly that analogy, <laughs> Dan. Um, but uh, I guess the one that I'm going to pick on, uh, I mean, I love the developer productivity features in Visual Studio, but one thing that absolutely excites me is this feature around uh, the um, SQL uh, connection resiliency. Um, oh, for Entity Framework, yeah. Exactly. Uh, give kind of like the quick overview sure. for people who By don't the way, know it also that. applies for ADO.net as well. So it's for EF and ADO.net. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. exactly. Oh, great, great. Um, but the, the scenario is this. Um, as, as developers migrate uh, essentially their backend more and more to the cloud, and when I say backend here is, is uh, specifically the database, one of the things that uh, uh, becomes absolutely crucial is connectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, because what happens is, imagine you have your uh, end users walk around with a device where you can't guarantee connectivity, so to speak, right? So uh, in turn, you have to write all this boilerplate code in your app to make sure, you know, as, as the user interacts with your app and con the connectivity right, right. goes on that, for example, uh, you establish the connection and, and, and Intermittent and so latency forth. issues. Uh, it, it's an excellent point. Uh, there, Dan, as well. And so what we've done uh, with this ADO.NET or AF uh, connection resolution feature is the fact that um, w when you host your database now in Azure, we automatically will retry a connection when it fails, right? right so right. Uh, imagine instead of your end user now getting uh, an handle exception saying the connection is timed out, right? right. We will basically uh, determine that there was a timeout and mm -hmm. we'll try the connection then Magic happens. <laughs> as far as the end user is concerned, it's like, wow, this just continues working, right? Yeah. And uh, I love, and the reason why it's my favorite feature is, um, uh, you know, .NET, because it's all about uh, developer productivity, I love, love features where we just, you know, say, you know, we take on the burden of the hard work, right? Right. And as far as developers are concerned, you know, they should have uh, kind of the, the, the least barrier of adoption when it comes to, uh, adopting a feature like uh, essentially a SQL connection resiliency. So that, that's Love how. It. Awesome. Uh, so uh, XAML TOE asks, are there any improvements in startup time, working set, et cetera? So you talked about some of these fundamentals. Right. But it'd be great. Like, do you have some some either numbers or things that you specifically looked at working set or, or some of the maybe garbage collection things or startup time in general? Uh, uh, startup time, uh, as our fundamentals uh, work is, 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 is broad, means it's cross-cutting, right? Mm -hmm. So when we do work, it, it benefits everything at least a little bit. Right. Um, but as far as uh, performance specifically is concerned, uh, Dan, a, a couple of features that we have done is with uh, multi-code multi JIT, for example. So this right. is for your ASP.NET websites, where uh, today, if you have uh, more than one core on your machine, uh, um, ASP.NET sites uh, don't take advantage of, of, of that when it comes to multi-core jitting. Right. So uh, as of Visual Studio 2013, it's actually built in your project templates as well now, where awesome. ASP.NET websites uh, uh, automatically take advantage of multi-core jit. And we've seen improvements in startup time uh, up, up to about 15% uh, what it comes awesome. as well. So, so real quick question there. Yes. I have an existing ASP.NET yes. website. I upgrade my service to 451. Yes. I have to put a setting then in my project to take advantage there is of a, this? There uh, is a setting to, uh, to make that happen. Um, and uh, that is now documented on our blog. So if you go to blogs.msdn.com 
forward slash dot net. Uh, that's all spelled out. T O T N E T. Exactly, T O N T. And uh, that's uh, you'll, you'll find out what the actual. It's a very slight change to your project. But okay. again, one of our things then is. We would love our developers to make as few changes as possible when it comes to their code, right? So sure, your sure. code just, you know, suddenly your users get a much better experience because <laughs> you upgrade it. Yeah, it's great, especially if it's such a small change for an existing site and all of a sudden 15% improvement is, is amazing. Right, right. So uh, more questions here. All right, here, here's uh, another more thought-provoking one asked by Tony. What was the hardest feature to incorporate? So what is, you know... What kept, what kept you up at night? What kept me up at night? Uh, let me see. Um, I'm going to pick on 64-bit um, and continue. And let me tell you uh, okay. why, Dan. So uh, if you look uh, across a, a particular experience in Visual Studio that um, has to do with .NET, uh, you have to incorporate the .NET runtime, the .NET framework, yeah. the languages, and the tools. <laughs> so uh, and. Uh, DevDiv and Visual Studio is a very, very large team. So having to coordinate an experience that spans the gamut of those uh, teams, it, it's quite challenging because you basically have to handshake uh, with everyone, make sure that everyone understands what the requirements are, <laughs> what the scenarios are. Right. And uh, to make something like Edit and Continue, where as a developer, it's like, huh, oh, it, it just works, so to speak, right? Right, right. Uh, uh, it, it takes an incredible amount of, <laughs> of uh, energy to make that uh, happen. But uh, So every time I, 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 I step into or step <laughs> right. over, I'll make sure to be like, thank, thank Habib. Uh, this, is, this is great. So th that's really the things where we have to coordinate across, and sometimes all the way into the various platforms like Windows and Windows Phone as well, it is uh, um, uh, making sure that everyone's on the same page and we're delivering the best experience. Because you can imagine, Dan, you, you light up three or four of those scenarios and suddenly the fifth scenario isn't quite up to snuff yet. The entire thing just buckles down and kind of you know uh, yeah. kind of falls apart. So uh, <laughs> yeah, those are, I'd say, the most challenging ones. OK, great. Um, uh, some more questions coming in here. Uh, Robin, what is the state of Project Rosalind? So that's more a language service team, but do you want to yes. just, do you have sort of like a, a quick update there? Uh, or do you feel like you could talk about it? It's, it's more a language service right, team it, versus... Right, it is definitely more uh, uh, language uh, service uh, question. So um, I'm not going to, I guess, uh, break into jail then by, 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 by saying something that I don't have I will, but, that, but I mean, <laughs> that, that, that's my tolerance, sure. Uh, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's still uh, going on very, very strong. Okay. And, uh, you know, whenever the team is ready to uh, uh, share more information about it, I'm sure uh, they will as well. So. Okay. Um, got some more questions, of course. Sure. Uh, uh, Jeremy Alves asks, let's go with an embarrassing question. Okay. This is, I just want to pause there and get you scared, but it's not that bad. <sighs> any word, I think he means any word, on the C Sharp native or project and compiler projects. Okay. Um, so I guess for the benefit of everyone, I'm going to uh, set some uh, context here. So this morning in uh, Soma's keynote in New York, uh, I believe it was Orville uh, mm -hmm. who showed a, a demo of um, um, Fresh Paint, which is one of the uh, hero applications on Windows. For Windows Store apps. Exactly, sure. exactly. Uh, running on uh, Surface RT um, um, 8.1. And he showed a before and uh, an after experience. And um, the after experience was uh, based around a new uh, native compilation technology that we're working on. Um, I'm not going to uh, throw ah. around the uh, code names, but uh, I think that the thing I want to really highlight, uh, Dan, is that this, even though this might seem new, it's been a journey for us. Okay. Uh, if you think about it, you know we've had native compilation around for a long time. Engine, you engine, yeah. engine has been around for a long for time. Sure. You know we, we had engine, uh, then we added all engine. And in fact, if you also look at, look at it um, with uh, Windows uh, Phone, we introduced the idea of cloud compilation. Which again is very similar, where we take IL and essentially we compile it down um, uh, to almost a native there as well. And then it's a very natural progression where you know we have the core technologies, we've been doing it for a number of years, we have high confidence that we can deliver this experience. So mm -hmm. the next natural step is you know let's look at where we actually can take this technology. Great. Uh, so what you saw from uh, Soma's keynote this morning was a very early glimpse of what that looks like. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we're going to share a lot more as we incubate and, and really get into this technology. But the idea is, uh, look, what we want to focus on is how do we deliver the best experience on the device, right? Mm -hmm. And that's all about optimizing .NET 
for a device so that it, it, it's snappy, it's fast, fast. And, and it's us that. doing it kind of for you. Exactly. You know, Again, things. it goes back to the thing of like, we want to take on the burden so that yes. developers don't have to. Love it. OK. A uh, couple more questions here. Uh, Peter, so code contracts have been in the BCL for some time. However, the useful tooling runtime static checking is being shipped as extensions from Dev Labs. Is this still the case uh, for VS 2013? What are the future plans for these code contracts e extensions? Yes, I believe then that's still the case, meaning it's still uh, um, uh, uh, shipping separately from uh, uh, tooling versus tooling. framework. Yeah, exactly, tooling from uh, uh, framework. Um, uh, we don't have any definite plans that I can announce at this point of sure. what the plans are. But one thing that I, I, I can uh, tell you then is this. Uh, what we are trying to look at is um, how do we push quality further up the stream when it comes to developer experience, period, sure. right? I mean, code contracts is certainly one of that experiences. Mm -hmm. More diagnostic experience, like uh, editing continue and so forth, is more of that. Right. Uh, I can tell you the, that theme will continue, uh, meaning okay. uh, with code contracts and so forth and additional features where we're going to push quality upstream further and further. You're going to see a lot more experiences, in my humble opinion, in, in future versions of .NET and Visual Studio, where it's like, you know, um, it should be at the at the tip of your fingertips, then, right? It, yeah, it should yeah. not be that I have to launch X, Y, and Z and get to that uh, information. And and uh, I think that's something that we are going to see more where, okay, kind of that information at your at your fingertips. Sure. Um, uh, a couple more questions as they come in here. Uh, James asks, in uh, .NET Framework 4.5.1. Mm -hmm. You change the way uh, of uh, load and unload assemblies. Uh, we have to continue app, use app domain. So I guess the question is, uh, there was a change on load and lo unloading of assemblies, and do you have to continue using app domains? Or uh, can you I, talk about that sort of in general? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that, Dan. I actually uh, James, congratulations. <laughs> you you have uh, stopped me. It might be. That this is, is, <laughs> Uh, you know, it might be something that we've literally changed in the bowels of the runtime, <laughs> and I don't actually know what the answer is. So, okay. Uh, as I mentioned, other one of our um, kind of social networks. If you want to post that, we'll sure. get back to you. James actually stuff. probably wrote the feature and is asking okay. the question <laughs> just to go. try and stump you. Thank you, James. <laughs> uh, good question. So, uh, Wakar, I hope I got that name right. Any IAS upgrade required for deploying site? So, um, I think this is. Uh, to take 4.5.1. Okay. Uh, as long as you upgrade the framework, there's nothing in IAS specifically that you need to upgrade. Uh, no. Uh, the one thing I do want to point out, and thanks for bringing this up, is uh, to take advantage of the ASP.NET app suspension feature. Yes. Uh, you do require uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, which comes with IIS 8.5. That, that's oh, really that's the, good to know. That's, that's the, good to know. And uh, when you go to our blogs, we've we've, we've, we've Documented up the, uh, that information uh, as well, but uh, as far as .NET 4.5.1 is concerned, uh, there is no uh, requirements imposed as far as IS. Uh, um, okay, is. great. Uh, got a couple more minutes here, and want to get to uh, two questions. So, Sarab Jane's uh, he's asking a ton of questions. So, uh, <laughs> any improvement in garbage collection algorithm that's visible to the developer? So, if one, you you all sort of have a you know don't touch just just trust the garbage collection <laughs> yes. algorithm and just trust, trust the garbage collector. What about like ways that I can control uh, and manage uh, garbage collection? Anything there? Uh, yeah. So I, I want to repeat what uh, Dan, Dan said. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the mantras is that you know the .NET garbage collector is a well tuned machine. So we would <laughs> love our developers uh, you know to to. Uh, take a second look at perhaps their application architecture. It might be a, a different issue. However, having said that, we did make a pretty significant investment in .NET 4.5.1 as, well as, uh, as far as our garbage collection is concerned. And that is to do with the large object uh, heap. Yes, yes. So what you can do in .NET 4.5.1 is that um, we have seen, and this is a, a, a very, very small set of uh, customers, and, and, and hopefully I'm not over advertising this feature too much, but a small set of uh, customers then, uh, they really do handle these large uh, objects, and that's mm -hmm. objects in .NET, uh, I believe, greater than, than 85K. Okay. Um, and so uh, what, what happens with uh, uh, these scenarios is that there's a time where you basically hit an out of memory exception because you've, you've uh, uh, right. basically um, used up uh, too much memory. So in .NET 4.5.1, we now have introduced the ability to be able to force uh, a collection of the large object uh, heap. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if, if if you have scenarios uh, such as where you are running out of memory, multimedia editing, or something uh, where you or, have large or files. large big data is a classic example sure. of that, right? Where people are really um, processing massive amounts of, of, of data and they're storing them in this ginormous arrays, for example, and so right. forth. Uh, uh, so you can now essentially control the large object heap. And um, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, uh, we have now uh, documented that on our blog as well, as well as our proper documentation. So if you just literally went to it right now, you'll see that I think it's the fourth entry down the list right now that you see that information. Great. Uh, we got 30 seconds. Okay. And I do want to get to uh, Dan's question uh, just to close this up. Uh, do the .NET team work at all with the WinRT team? WinRT encompasses a subset of .NET. Do they plan on implementing the newer .NET framework features? Do you share a code base? Like, like how, do, how does the interaction work between WinRT team obviously has some version of .NET you all have, and you know there's sort of probably a little bit of that going on right. too as well. Yeah, I, my view on this, Dan, is that it really is uh, all one .NET. And, and, and what you'll see is with WinRT, there are essentially um, you know, projections of .NET. So as far mm -hmm. as the same experience in Visual Studio is concerned, productivity. But um, uh, directly to the point there, we collaborate extremely closely, obviously, with the Windows team, because as what, what we really care about is the consistency for our developers, regardless of what platform uh, you are actually targeting. So that's, great. that's extremely important for us. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, 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 Windows Store or desktop or, or server. Uh, we work with all the various platforms inside Microsoft to make sure you have, developers have a great consistent experience. Awesome. Habib, thank you so much for great. taking those questions. And uh, we are going to cut to our next video. And thank you all. Appreciate great. it. Thank you.